the Chicago Theater of the Air. By Mary and Claire, written and directed by Jack LaFondre, conducted by Robert Trent, radio programs, the famous Chicago Theater of the Air productions of the greatest musical dramas. Tonight's performance, Ivan Carroll's Pink Lady, starring Virginia Haskins, David Polary, Ruth Slater, and Earl Wilkie, with an all-Chicago dramatic cast headed by Muriel Bremner and Everett Clark. Featured speaker is Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. In performing The Pink Lady this evening, we are going back to the French music hall days of more than 40 years ago, a saucy and somewhat daring era in which clandestine romantic conquests seem to be much the order of the day. Mythical creatures known as nymphs and satyrs chased through the fields and woodlands in constant search of members of the opposite sex. On Wings of Fancy, the Chicago Theater of the Air presents The Pink Lady. <laughs> The satyr, you know, is a creature of mythology, half man, half beast, a jolly creature who loves music, wine, and women, <laughs> mostly women. At the moment, there appears to be a satyr at large in the wooded suburbs of Paris. His favorite sport is chasing young nymphs here, there, and everywhere, and when he catches... 
is one. Just a moment. What is going on here? Did I hear a mademoiselle in distress? Oh, hardly in distress, monsieur. If only mortal man could make love like the Satan. Here's a lady who yesterday was no one. In the neighborhood, this famous as a slow one. She's now a fascinator, and the world will celebrate her as a lady. It's going to captivate the Satan. For the Satan knows the beauty when he sees her. And she has to be the best before her squeeze her. If a girl can take the same, then you really have to rate her as a proposition for the secret. Oh, Monsieur Beniveau, how could a detective be so cruel as to interrupt the incomparable embrace of a satyr? I have instruction to place the satyr behind bars. I... Wait. May I inquire how you happen to know that I am a detective... And my name is Benevol, Marquisan. I'm quite a student of the male species, Monsieur Benevol. A fascinating subject. So? Ooh, la la! If I were not on duty, Mademoiselle, uh, perhaps... Wait. I know you now. The lady in pink. Oh, yes, the lady in pink. But you may call me Claudine, my handsome minion of the law. Handsome minion of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you don't. I have heard of your shameless flirtation. You have run out of men, and now you go looking for satyrs, eh? Huh? Oh, I could do worse. Except that satyrs' hooves make awkward dancing. Mademoiselle Claudine, I command you, stand where you are. Oh, don't tell me you're going to hold me captive at the point of a gun. Better than that, Mademoiselle. A camera. Your picture will make very useful evidence when I capture the Satan. Oh, a camera. Isn't it strange, monsieur? It seems that every man I meet wants a picture of me to carry next to his heart. This picture I will carry to the police files, mademoiselle in pink. And if you are mixed up with that Satan... Wait. Hold that pause. Everything I do, everything I don't do, everything I will... Everything I won't do, what I do and don't do, what I will and won't do, every single thing is worth a photo. All your little things, all your little papers, look and you will find in the daily papers. All the daily papers, follow up by capers, every single morning with a photo. Bring along the camera, fetch along the camera, don't have any doubt about it. Hurry up the camera, got to have the camera, can't do anything without it. When I sing, when I talk, when I drink, when I walk, if you want to catch it all in total, you must be on the spot and let me take a shot, for everything I do is worth a photo. When I think, when I talk, when I drink, when I walk, if you want to catch it all in photo, you, you must, must be on the spot and if we take a shot, for everything I do is worth a photo, for everything I do is worth a photo. look quite interesting, do they not? A mysterious satyr and an even more mysterious lady in pink. Next, we meet another susceptible victim to the pink lady's charms. It's the wealthy and handsome Lucien Garidel, engaged to be married in six weeks, but right now enjoying adventure where he finds it. I'm going to be married in June. It's now the beginning of May, and so I'm still free to commune with a life that is single and gay. I'm free, but it's almost a sin. Already I ought to be true. I ought to behave so sedately and act just as good husbands do. But not just yet, just yet, just yet. I've got about six weeks more. Then I must forget, forget, 
forget all the joys I have known before. Of course, at the end of my bachelorhood, I'm sure to reform and grow perfectly good. <laughs> But not just yet, just yet, just yet. I'm single for six weeks more. Not yet, just yet, just yet, just yet. You've got about six weeks more. Six weeks to coquette, coquette, coquette with the life that we all adore. Of course, at the end of my bachelorhood, I'm sure to reform and grow perfectly good. But not just yet, just yet. I'm single for six weeks more. Single for six weeks. Six weeks more. Oh, my handsome Lucien. I was beginning to think you weren't coming to keep our little um, appointment. Forgive me for being late, Claudine. When I arranged to have lunch with you out here at the suburban restaurant, I was under the impression that it was a secluded spot. <laughs> I know. And now it seems that everyone in Paris is here on the trail of the satyr. What is this satyr legend? Do you believe there is any such creature? Well, the police evidently think so. There's a detective out here investigating the rumors. A detective? Mm -hmm. Claudine, if we're seen together, what of Angèle? What did my fiancé think oh, if... Oh, it's not very flattering to worry about Angèle when you're with me, Lucien. When love wants to nestle, oh, where does he nest? Close in a maiden's heart. He may for a while, but he soon wants a rest. You've never felt his dart. For love is a cynical charm. And a family orchard eater, and for a bit in roasted in raked earth, and only considers himself. My love is a perfect baby, a beautiful innocent boy. In days that are past, he was made. But being a baby will cloy As soon as temptation attacks him He drops all his habits divine And then every night up at Maxine's He squanders his kisses Believe me, Claudine, if I had met you sooner, before I became engaged to Angèle... Monsieur, just what have you told Angèle about us? Hmm? I mean, surely you didn't tell her that you were keeping a rendezvous with a maiden of, uh, shall we say, a questionable reputation at a remote woodland restaurant. No. As a matter of fact, I didn't. 
since I've been meeting you, I've told Angèle that I'm visiting with an eccentric old inventor named Don Didier, who has a new in- aviation device that I'm interested oh, in. An eccentric old inventor with an aviation device. Oh, would any woman trust a man that far? Beautiful lady, when I'm with you, I can dream that there is no one else in the world. An old inventor. How many inventions are created by love? I'd be not president, but just he who plays the violin, the band of the cafe de Paris. For then I should have a chance by fiddling to enhance and fill the arms of our romance, the prettiest girls in France. I love Angel, of course. That's why I'm engaged to her. But I can no more resist your bewitching charms than I can live without air or sun or stars. Of course you can't. That's why I have. Uh, what I have, Lucien. So, Lucia. Huh? <gasps> Angel? So, so this lady in pink is your Monsieur Don Didier. 
eccentric inventor, indeed. But, Angèle, this, this lady I is... I don't think you quite understand, Mademoiselle Angèle. Oh, I don't, don't I? It just happened that Detective Beneval informed me that Lucien was keeping a rendezvous with a, a notorious lady in pink. And everything seems quite obvious to me. Detective Beneval does not make mistakes, monsieur. I have the evidence right here in my camera. I don't think you have all the evidence, Monsieur Beneval. Huh? You see, I happen to be Madame Don Didier. What? what? Uh, yes, you see, uh, poor Monsieur Don Didier is ill. He has uh, lumbago, poor fellow. He asked his wife to meet me here to, to uh, talk over his invention. Hmm. Invention, indeed. Just why haven't you ever invited me to meet this mysterious Monsieur Don Didier, Lucien? I, uh, I'd like to, Angel. I really would, but... Yes? Uh, well, he's rude to women. You see, Angel, uh, Monsieur Don Didier is the, uh, the satyr. The, the satyr? I know you both sympathize with me. Being married to a satyr has its difficulties, but uh, you'll have to forgive my husband, for he is a genius. An inventor? Uh, tell me, Lucien... Just where does this satyr, this Monsieur Don Didier, live? Well, he lives at... At, at number 72 Rue Saint-Honoré. Number 72 Rue Saint-Honoré. Number 72 Rue Saint-Honoré? <laughs> yes, uh, number 72 Rue Saint-Honoré. But I, I wouldn't advise calling on him. Uh, chasing nymphs through the damp forest brought on his lumbago, and he's too ill to see anyone. Well, nymphs or no nymphs, ill or not ill, he's going to see me. That is, if such a person lives at 72 Rue Saint-Honoré. And he will see me, monsieur. I have orders to get evidence on the satyr and arrest him. If you're telling the truth, I will ask your forgiveness, Lucien. But remember, I have a fast car and you can't get a train out of here for half an hour. It's very important that I get there first, Lucien. Um, yes, yes, of course, Angel. Of course. Number 72, Rue Saint-Honoré. The end of my search for the satyr. Detective Benevol, let me compliment you. You are a genius. Claudine, what have I gotten into? There's no such person as Monsieur Don Didier. I simply used any name that occurred to me. Oh, but there is such a person, Lucien. What? I happen to know an old antique dealer named Don Didier who lives at 72 Rue Saint Oh, but but what happens when Algel and that detective get there? Oh, I thought of that, naturally. So I bribed a waiter to puncture Angel's tires. And if we make that trade, perhaps Monsieur Don Didier will hearken to the cause of romance. You bribed a waiter to punch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful lady, what would I do without you? is an original Chicago Theater of the Air production of The Pink Lady, an operetta favorite of more than 40 years ago. Our stars are Virginia Haskins, David Polary, Ruth Slater, and Earl Wilkie, our conductor, Robert Trendler, and our narrator, Marion Clare. At this time, it is our sincere pleasure, as always, to present our featured speaker of this broadcast series, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, distinguished editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, noted world historian, and outspoken American patriot. Tonight, Colonel McCormick will speak on the historic background of American Indians. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. In 
Indians by one of them. Our history depict Indians as enemies. <clears throat> they fought with the French against the colonies in the French and Indian Wars. They fought with the English against the states in the Revolution and the War of 1812. They fought the white man's advance right across the country. We look upon them, therefore, as treacherous, cruel, wielding scalping knives and burning prisoners alive. Our enmity has blinded us to their accomplishments. Their original contributions to permanent society were the birch bark canoe, laced and bored snowshoes, and the moccasin to wear with them. Their birch bark canoes could accommodate up to 30 men. South of the birch country, they made inferior canoes of elm bark. White men did not learn to use birch bark and only to make wooden snowshoes. In Florida and British Columbia, they had large dugout canoes for navigating the ocean. They invented the dog sled and the dog pack. They invented the teepee with ears to let smoke out on the east side, which they fastened with original knots. Indians followed trails, chose the best walking in the shortest distances, considering topography and fords. When they used canoes, they followed portages between navigable waters. When trees fell across the trails, they walked around them. Even after they received steel axes, they did not cut out their trails. All the Indians erected palisades. Some of them made large houses of rude boards with their stone axes. They used wooden army until muskets made it useless. They had a currency in the form of wampum. They gave us corn, squash, beans, pumpkins, root beer, maple sugar, and tobacco. They gave us the pipe and the cigar. The Turks, I believe, produced the cigarette. They used fish to fertilize the corn hills. They harvested wild rice and ate off wooden dishes. From eating it when short of food, they discovered that the inner bark of the tree when cooked, cured scurvy, without appreciating, of course, the fact that they discovered vitamin B. They used boiled bark and green oak leaves as antiseptics. They also ate all forms of wild fruit, honey, mushrooms, insects, snakes, acorns, dandelions, burdock, and a number of roots. All kinds of fish and shellfish, all animals except otter, including seals, sea lions, and walrus in the north, and manatee in the south. They sucked sugar cane wherever it was found, but did not extract the sugar. Their favorite food was dog meat, which seemed strange, but Raoul Amundsen, who ate it on his polar expeditions, told me it is excellent. They used steam baths when white men used no baths. They had bone fish hooks, and wooden fish spears. They made bows of thorn apple wood. They hammered out copper fish hooks. We know there was trade in copper between them because Verrazano found Indian women at Newport, Rhode Island, with copper bracelets. That there was trade in flints because we find arrowheads far from flint rocks. They probably traded in bow wood and perhaps birch bark canoes. They used deadfall traps and fish traps. They worked with stone blades and bone needles. They were masters in basket making, and for musical instruments they had rattles, drums, and flutes. They invented lacrosse and had a game resembling pell-mell. They had pottery, but as pottery was inconvenient to take on war parties, they used birch bark vessels and the paunches of animals in which they threw hot stones for cooking. Indians could cook up to one, could count up to 1,000, doing it by a turn through their fingers, but of course did not understand the decimal system. They knew the time of day generally from the position of the sun. They counted time by days, moons, and seasons. They had picture writing, which was also art. 
They made a form of statuary and totem poles, which they also colored. They decorated themselves and even their pipes with feathers. In the horse country, colored horse hair were decorations. Bear claws were worn as trophies of the chase. The Indians of the Southwest had masonry houses, new weaving, grinding of corn by hand, and smoke writing. Recently, a prehistoric mummy was found in South Africa, wrapped in a sheet 80 feet long. Writers on their habits, their customs, and their government seem very superficial. Some even suggest that they belong to the lost tribes of Israel, pointing out such similarities as the law of revenge and tribal customs. They ignore the fact that this was true of all primitive people. Families grew into tribes, and the old man was the boss. The head of the Roman family had more power than any Indian chief. They had their forms of asylum like other early people. There were a number of Indian language, probably from a common source. They practiced polygamy, promiscuity, and incest. The torture of prisoners was a practice of sadism. They were extremely infertile, and because of the lack of child food, mothers nursed their children for several years. This combined with their warfare kept the population down. There were a variety of inheritance customs among the Indians. Clark Whistler in the American Indian says, both male and female inheritance are recognized according to the respective social area. In a very considerable part of North America, at least, the teepee, furniture, and all food was the property of the woman, regardless of whether descent was reckoned in the male or female line. J.K. Dixon in The Vanishing Race says, they bury with their dead all the belongings of the deceased. When the great chief Spotted Tail died, they killed his two ponies, placing their heads towards the east. The war bonnets and war shirts are folded away with the silent dead. Among the Crow Indians before dying, a man might call out that he wished to give one or two horses to his wife or son, and such a wish was respected, though the bulk of the herd would fall to the brother's share. Sacred objects and ceremonial privileges were often bequeathed to the eldest son, the succession was irregular, not necessarily following either paternal or maternal line. <clears throat> On the Pacific Slope, and among the Hoopa, varying lengths of river shore were held as private fishing rights by heads of family. And these rights passed from father to son and were always respected. Property marks were placed upon weapons and implements by the Indian tribes. A hunter established his claim to an animal by his personal mark upon the arrow, which inflicted the fatal wound. Among the Indians of the Eskimo, it was customary to bury the dead, those articles with which were the personal property of the deceased, either man or woman. In some of the tribes, the distribution of all property of the dead, including the dwelling, formed part of the funeral ceremony. The Navajo and Hopi inheritance laws stem from a curious Mormonism and an even more curious sense of hospitality. Navajos and Hopis picked up and discarded wives rather freely. Sometimes a number of wives are around at the same time. The children get considerably mixed up. Also, the terms father and uncle are considerably confused. It seems an uncle under the laws of hospitality is accorded privileges which frequently make him the true father. The tribe knows these various relationships and straightens them out. When I was in the army, an Indian soldier came to me and said he wanted to stop the allotment to his wife. I asked him why, and he replied, she is married again. I then found out that our government recognizes polygamy among the Indians. Strange to relate, Hundreds of years before our Constitutional Convention, five Indian tribes, the Cayugas, Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, and Senecas, combined to form the Iroquois, and were afterwards joined by a sixth tribe, the Tuscaroras. As they were more agricultural than their neighbors, the Iroquois could live more compactly and were stronger. Their time of greatest strength was when they obtained muskets from the Dutch, 
with which they exterminated the Hurons and drove all their neighbors far away. Their power ranged from Maine and Virginia to Wisconsin and Illinois. They were conquered by General Sullivan in the Revolutionary War. Because of the Wyoming and Cherry Valley massacres, he destroyed their villages and crops, marveling at the extent of their cornfields and orchards. The origin of the paddle is lost in history, but the double-bladed paddle, I believe, originated with the Eskimos. The Eskimos also originated the parka, which we wear in the north woods, and they originated watertight boots of sealskin centuries before the rubber boot. In 1763, the Indian Pontiac united almost all of the Indians east of the Mississippi in a union against the white man which had many successes but was defeated in the end. Indian powwows were meetings either of tribes or of leaders of tribes. The Indians were prone to oratory and robotity. There was no voting at these meetings, and decisions had to be reached by unanimous vote, much as in the ancient Polish kingdom. There were a number of very skillful Indian generals, of whom the Sioux Sitting Bull and the Apache Geronimo are the best known. Geronimo was only captured by treachery. Of all the Indians, the Creeks accepted civilization first and reached the highest form. In the recent war, a one-eighth Cherokee named Jodas James Clark was an admiral in the American Navy. And on the occasion of a victory, uttered a war whoop from the bridge of his ship. Speaking from the stage of the Chicago Theater of the Air, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has delivered another in his weekly series of informative commentaries presented as a public service feature of this program. Free copies of tonight's address on American Indians may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. The Chicago Theater of the Air continues tonight's production of The Pink Lady... Starring Virginia Haskins, David Polary, Ruth Slater, and Earl Wilkie, with narration by Marion Clare. this night. An elusive satyr is said to be roaming the woodlands of Paris, the object of an intensive search by Detective Beneval. Strangely associated with the satyr is a beautiful young lady in pink named Claudine, who has been keeping rendezvous with the handsome young Lucien, who in turn is engaged to marry the lovely Angèle. Angèle has discovered this clandestine romance and has been told that the lady in pink is the wife of Don Didier, an eccentric inventor with whom Lucien has business. Monsieur Don Didier, however, is actually an antique dealer who knows none of the participants in this saucy adventure. As a matter of fact, Monsieur Don Didier has his own difficulties. Very perplexing, very perplexing indeed. Things like that do not walk away by themselves. They were here when this storeroom was cleaned last year. I shall have to report this matter to the police. From under my very nose, they have been stolen. Uh, uh, oh, customers. Oh, we're in time, Claudine. Uh, something I can do for you, please? Oh, fortune is with us, Lucia. Apparently, we have arrived before your own shell and her detective. So I am talking to myself, perhaps. Uh, something I can do for you, please? Oh, Monsieur Don Didier, Monsieur Lucien here seems to be having romantic difficulties, and you fit right in the middle. Romantic difficulties? Thieves have broken into my storeroom, and you bother me with trifles. Trifles? Monsieur Don Didier, romance is the most important thing in the world. Mm. <laughs> when I look at you, mademoiselle, what you say seems entirely possible. Oh, la, la. Talking of men, who do you trust when a woman says, who little men, they simply must constant love declare. Look round and see on every side what they Some of them who have to hide 
no, no, no. At my age, I must think of other things. Uh, listen I... carefully, monsieur. My fiancée is coming here, and she thinks you're a business acquaintance of mine. I am? You're an eccentric inventor. A what? You have an aviation device. Aviation which? And lumbago. I never felt better in my life. And you understand. Even though I used your name, I never knew you existed at all. I don't. Uh, I don't. And this young lady here is your wife. My wife? So, now you are getting very interesting. Uh, Monsieur Dondidier, please. You see, we arrived here first before his fiancée. You I... see, she had flat tires. A fiancé with flat tires? Uh, punctured with a fork, you understand. Enough, enough. Uh, Monsieur Dondidier, don't you understand what we mean? Uh, no. Oh. Oh, no, look here, Don Didier. When a man's done something he shouldn't do, he wants to hide it. He has to set up an alibi. You're my alibi. Hmm? I was having lunch this noon with... With, with me. With, with you, I have no appetite for food, mademoiselle. While we were dining, in came the young lady I was engaged to. Now, what was I to do? Monsieur, I tell you, I have my own troubles. Thieves in my storeroom. I, I introduced Claudine as your wife. But would I, I... Johnny. <laughs> Tell me more. My fiance demanded your address. Claudine gave this address, and we rushed away to find you. Luckily, we're here ahead of Angèle and her detective. There, that's the whole story. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Very simple. Young man, young lady. I refuse to be a party to any deception such as this. I, oh, I... what a perfectly beautiful set of antique candlesticks. How much are they? I say I refuse to be a party to... Uh, 7,000 francs. Claudine, you think of everything. Shall we make the price an even 10,000 francs, monsieur? Well... It will be the first lie I ever told uh, at this price. There's just one more thing, Monsieur Dolidier. Yeah? You're a satyr. I... A what? A satyr, Monsieur. I told Angel you were a satyr. So when she gets here, you must behave rather awful. Eh? You must be shocking. Embrace the girl and try to kiss her. Yes, sir? What? Uh, I am an old man. What, what of my blood pressure? The ruder you are, the better. You're a satyr with lumbago. Oh, you are absolutely crazy. Lunatics I have in my oh, shop. Oh, I... Lucien, isn't that the most stunning antique mohair love scene? Ah, yes. Perfectly devastating. Uh, 10,000 francs, monsieur. And I am a satyr with lumbago. <laughs> I beg your pardon. My name is Angèle. Are you Monsieur Don Didier? Mademoiselle, I am going to kiss you. Ha! Ah, a satyr. I knew it the moment I laid eyes on him. I am going to kiss you with lumbago. No, no, no. Oh, no, don't you dare. Don't you... Oh, help! Oh. Help! You oh. are under arrest, Don Didier. You are under arrest. Detective Benavour has caught the satyr in his lair. Oh, he kissed me on the cheek, did Don Didier. Yes, he did. Oh, yes. Talking language did he speak, did Don Didier. Yes, he did. Oh, yes. And my temperament is cold and my dignity is great. Certainly, yes. By a feeling he was bored and he didn't hesitate. Oh, oh. But he kissed me on the cheek. Did Don Didier? Yes, he did. Didier? Yes, he did. Didier? Yes, he did. Did he do it? Didn't do it? Did he? 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 And there'll never be a mystery about the video. For he did it, did it, did it, yes he did. For he did it, did it, did it, yes he did, yes he did. Oops, I did, didn't lie, I.
Come with me, Monsieur Satyr. Detective Benavor always gets his men. But, Monsieur Detective, I am not a Satyr. I, you uh, I... certainly are. You tried to kiss me. How can you deny that? Hey, great. Who is making merry in this antique shop, eh? Huh? <laughs> who are you, madame? Who? Yes, who am I? I am Madame Don Didi Doodle, this gentleman's wife. Oh. You thought I was Catherine Hart? Why? You are Madame Don Didier? In the Bronx, he found me in a weak moment. <laughs> Look, behind my hope chest is hiding the store, Lucia, you. No, shell, my dear. After all, I'm still free to live as I please, until we're married, at least. You're free from now on, Lucien. And the lady in pink. Aha! Well, Lucien, we tried. But there's no point in being too serious about things. After all, there's always a new love to replace the old. Before in dearest country, I'm bidding goodbye to Claudia. I'm taking a tender farewell of her and of all that we've been. Claudine is a very old friend. I've known her for nearly a year. Alas, our sweet friendship must end for I'm doomed to a married career. Oh. Not just yet, just yet, just yet. I've got about six weeks more. Then I must forget, forget, forget all the joys I have known before. Claudine must become a mere dream of the past, and I, the conventional hobby of love. <laughs> but not just yet, just yet, just yet. I'm single for six weeks more. Not yet, just yet, just yet, just yet. You got up for six weeks more. Then you must forget, forget, forget all the joys you have known before. Claudine must become a mere dream of the past, and I, the conventional hobby, at last. But not just yet, just yet, just yet. I'm single for six weeks more. Well, this was just a final fling. After all, you were kissed by Monsieur Don Didier. Monsieur Don Didier, to think all the way to Paris I came to marry a schmo who thinks he's a satyr, maybe. All of a sudden, I am a satyr. I have no home and no wife. I have no antique shop. I am a licentious old reprobate. And for what? That is a good question. Uh, shall we attempt to answer it, my dear Benavol? Come with me, Monsieur Don Didier. I will put you to the test that no satyr can resist. Oh, what's the use of being serious? For the world's all right, if your heart is light, and then you are Mr. Imperious. And the days of the frolicking boy, no use to bother so and muss about. For a thing like this, just a stolen kiss, you've nothing here to make a fuss about. You've nothing here to make a fuss about. And just for a stolen kiss, why make such a fuss like this? So
Parisian ball. Among the dancers, we find Detective Benevol escorting Monsieur Dandidier, who is attempting to prove that he's not a satyr. We also find Lucien in search of his Angèle, while the mysterious lady in pink flirts shamelessly with all the gentlemen who come within her gaze. Monsieur Don Didier, this is more interesting than your antique shop, oui? Oh, Monsieur Detective, the young ladies I see here are hardly antiques. Oh, la, 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 la. So, just as I thought, Monsieur Don Didier, you are behaving just like a satyr. I don't know exactly what I'm behaving like, but whatever it is, <laughs> I like it. Ah, I perceive I am beginning to find all the evidence I need, monsieur. At half past two this afternoon, I was a moral man. Clink, 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 life in the joy, that was the wine boom. At half past three, a bold buffoon started a deadly plan to wreck my life on the rocks of sin, to break the door of my scruples in and push me over the brink, drink, drink. the brink where the glasses clink. Drink, drink. And the worst of it is, I like it. He likes it. I like it, likes it. My head goes round like a teetotum. My heart goes thump like a big bass drum. Hip, hip, whip, zip, hip, hip, whip, zip. Come and make things hum. And the worst of it is, I like it. He likes it. I like it. Likes it. And the worst of it is, I like it. He likes it. Yes, I do. And the worst of it is, he likes it. I like it. He likes it. His head goes round like a teetotum. My heart goes thump like a big bass drum. Hip, hip, with a zip, hip, hip, with a zip. Come and make things hum. And the worst of it is, I like it. He likes it. I like it. And the worst of it is, I like it. He likes it. Yes, he does. Angèle, Angèle, I've looked everywhere for you. Lucien, I, I don't want to talk to you. I hate you. After all, you did promise to marry me, Angèle. My affair with Claudine was harmless. There was something about her I couldn't resist, that's all. Why, of course, Angèle. Oh. Lucien told me personally how much he cares for you. The lady in pink. Are you everywhere at once? Practically. It's a peculiar gift I have. Ah, there you are, my lady in pink. I must say to her. Ooh la la. Oh, monsieur, don't eat yay. Control yourself. Say, this is strange. Mm -hmm. What is it, Monsieur Benevol? These films I took of the lady in pink at that restaurant. 
I picked them up from the photographer this morning and just happened to look at them. Oh, how disgraceful. Pictures of, of you and that woman dining together, Lucien. Oh, shall I, uh, the I... pictures of him came out all right, but, but where the lady in pink should be, there is nothing. Perhaps I was out with a ghost. <laughs> you can't photograph a ghost, Benneval. Well, there's certainly nothing ghostly about your Claudine. She looks like anything but a... Oh, Lucien, look! Claudine! Claudine, what's happened to you? What is this? The lady in pink has turned to stone. She... she's a statue. I, I, I cannot believe it. That statue disappeared from my antique shop a year ago. My, my missing Circe. Circe? Circe, goddess of temptation. She was in my storeroom with another statue. They both disappeared. Look, Lucien. There is another statue. See, standing next to her. A satyr. A satyr? What, what's the explanation of all this? Now I see it all. My Circe came to life to give you one more round of freedom before marriage. But she took her satyr with her just to be sure you didn't get too serious. The lady in pink. I understand now. A symbol of man's constant yearning for adventure and romance. Lucien, you'll never again have to yearn any further than me. Oh, Angel. So, Monsieur Diddy Doodle, you will take home your stone coiled, stone cold soisy, and I will be your hot patootie, no? Mm. <laughs> Who said old dogs can't learn new tricks, my dear? Wait a minute. <laughs> I must make a report to headquarters. Won't somebody explain this whole thing? My dear Monsieur Detective. No one has ever been able to explain love and romance. And perhaps it's just as well. <laughs> yes, just as well. Don't he do to stop looking at Soisy. You think you are Charles Boyer, maybe? Chicago Theatre of the Air production of The Pink Lady by Ivan Carroll, starring Virginia Haskins in the title role, David Polari as Lucien, Ruth Slater as Angel, and Earl Wilkie as Jean Didier. Featured speaker, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Performance rights were granted by the Thames Whitmark Music Library.
Heard in synchronized speaking roles tonight, Muriel Bremner as Claudine, Everett Clark as Lucien, Sandra Guerra as Angel, Carl Cronky as Don Didier, Roman Gottschalk as Benevol, Hope Summers as Madame Don Didier. This is Lee Bennett cordially inviting you to next week, Chicago Theater of the Air production, The Chocolate Soldier, starring Virginia Haskins and David Polary. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.